Good evening. Good evening. It's good to see each and every one of you tonight. Uh, uh, today I was in, in the, the jail, and uh, of course, some of you know how uh, important that ministry is to me personally because I get a chance to deal with people who not only have they not been taught the things of God, they don't even believe in them and they think that the whole thing is a, is a money grab. And it's where we've reached in history. It helps me, though, to also realize that as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, who have the indwelling Holy Spirit of God in them, that there are people that are not being reached by members of the body of Christ. And some of us have become very religious, but I don't know that we're spiritual, or at least biblical. Because you can be spiritual without being biblical. And what God has done is that he's intended for there to be people. We, we need to understand the purpose of the body of Christ. I don't know that we do. I think we look at it as church. Instead of looking at it as God intended this to be our life. Everything in the, in the body to the extent that being born again is, is truly intended to make you a new creature. And I don't know that we're, we're accomplishing that as the body of Christ. Often, uh, be, what I believe is happening is that <clears throat> we look at the church as an organization and we've selected that this is the organization that I want to go to instead of viewing it as an entirely new still concept with indwelling Holy Spirit and the Word of God that's intended to really, really transform us. And I think that most of us are spending our day and the world, we, we're in the world and the world has consumed us. And we're really in the world, consumed by the world, living in the world, not applying even the principles that we have in the word of God so that we live victorious lives. Because the world can be so over-consuming. So you and I have a responsibility to do this as believers. We're supposed to be the people who are imparting wisdom to the world that comes from the word of God. That's our job, is to do that. We're to, impart, to be imparting it to a lost world that actually is seeking answers to their issues of life. They're dealing with life. They're dealing with their circumstances. They're dealing with their children. They're dealing with their marriages. They're dealing with their finances. They're dealing with their job. They're dealing with, with, with racism and patriotism and, pay, and all of the things that are consuming the world. And God established a people that was supposed to be here on this planet that were impacting people to say there was a whole nother life that God intended for you to have, and I want to demonstrate that life in front of you so that you would be attracted to it, and, if then, and then you would lift Christ up in your life, and he would then start drawing people. That's not happening. It's not happening at all. We're consumed with our circumstances. We're consumed with what we're dealing with. We have in our hands, in the word of God, not only the mind of Christ, but the wisdom that then goes with it. 
We are to study that wisdom, learn that wisdom, apply that wisdom, and then, put, then impart that wisdom to others who need the wisdom of God applied to their situation. So what Solomon does is that he writes in the, one of the wisdom books, in particular the book of Proverbs. And what he does is that he warns us that as wisdom is, is stretching, because he, he puts, and I'm not going back and going through all this, he puts wisdom in the female aspect. He calls wisdom a her. Okay? And he teaches us that, or he warns us, that wisdom is stretching out her hand that many will reject And because of their rejection, their disregard for it, their turning away from it is going to bring what the scripture calls, and I'm not teaching this tonight either, the laughter of God upon them. Because the scripture teaches that God is going to get the last laugh. And when they get, when most people are going to receive that last laugh, is at the great white throne judgment. But there is the judgment seat of Christ that we should be trying to bring people into so that when they perish, they stand before the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ, not the great white throne judgment, where they're going to hear the laughter of God because he, and this is how how he will laugh. He will look at them and say, you scorn me, you laugh me, you mock me, you ignored me, you did your thing in life, and now I get the last laugh. Every man's rejection is going to cause them to reap what they have sown. God gives you so many years on earth to be be a sower of seed. And every man who understands anything about, about reaping and sowing should know that you reap what you've sown. It's just the way it is. He says this in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 33. He says... Because here's what he challenges us then. He said, but whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil. And it's a warning. He's saying you can live your whole life and and, and blow me off. You can keep doing your worldliness, keep doing the world, allowing the world to consume you. But whoso hearkeneth unto me, that person is going to dwell safely. And I don't believe that that's just at the judgment seat of Christ or in eternity. I believe that they'll dwell safely here on planet Earth. You will always reap what you've sown. It's just the way it is. Understanding that, historically, when Solomon's writing this, first of all, he was writing this to his son, Rehoboam. But doctrinally, he was writing it to the nation of Israel because they were God's son. But then inspirationally, he was writing it to you and me as sons of God. So my prayer for us to look at even tonight is to use the word of God in our lives so that we learn to apply biblical wisdom to our issues of life. And we all have them. We cannot be a people that hears wisdom, is taught wisdom, but never allows wisdom to lead and guide us through the issues of life that we find ourselves in, in the midst of, so that we continue to handle everything in our life in a worldly way. God never intended that. People died for this book. And in it, 
We have wisdom. And God wants you to apply that wisdom. If you got a problem with your kids, use biblical wisdom. You got a problem in your marriage, use biblical wisdom. You're struggling at work, use biblical wisdom. You're struggling in your finances, apply biblical wisdom. You're struggling with any issue of life, apply wisdom. God intends for us to apply it so that as we are living here on planet Earth, we are actually growing and maturing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what he intends. So let's look at, you have an outline that I handed out. And uh, here we go. We're going to begin by looking at how wisdom can protect you. We're going to look at the conditions that you need to acquire wisdom and then how wisdom then must be received. So he starts in Proverbs chapter 2 is where we're, we're, we're coming from. And you can, you can just turn there and we're going to be going a, a couple of places, but I need to get through this tonight. And know this, church. My objective is not just that you just come to Bible study. So he starts in Proverbs chapter 2. He says that the first half, of Proverbs chapter 2, he says, my son. And again, right, written historically to Rehoboam, doctrinally to the nation of Israel, inspirationally is written to me and you as sons of God. He says, my son, he says, if thou wilt receive my words, God has given us the wisdom of God. He said, you got to receive it though. The reception of wisdom is something that is conditional because Solomon uses the term if. He says, my son, if thou shalt receive my words. As human beings, you know what we have? We have something called volition. You know what volition is? It's free will. Because you don't have to, you can come to church every Sunday. You can be here at Bible study consistently. You can sit here and still not receive it. You still, you, you hear it, but you don't receive it. Hallelujah. Volition is the ability to choose. As much as God desires for us to love him, to honor him, to obey him, to worship him, to praise him, mankind has been given a choice to do so. That volition is extended to receiving the words of wisdom that Solomon is speaking about here. You don't have, he said, if you do it, there's something that will happen. But if you don't, you're just going to keep going through the issues of life and never rise above them. As the descendants of, of Adam, descendants of Adam, we have been given a human spirit. God's original plan was for our human spirit to be indwelt by his Holy Spirit. But Adam's disobedience caused all of mankind to have a dead spirit that can only be quickened or made alive when we accept the payment that Jesus Christ made for the sin that Adam passed on to us that caused us to lose our spirit, to have a human spirit that is, that is dead in trespasses and sins. Until then, fallen man, the state that all men are before he is regenerated by God's spirit, you know what it's been towards? Sinfulness. But even when we have the Spirit of God indwelling us, we're saved, or at least we tell people we are. God does not remove from us volition. 
the ability to choose. In other words, God doesn't make you a robot. You don't serve him because he demands it. He gives you a choice. And he says it this way. He says, choose this day whom you will serve. Every morning, you get, to, you get to get up and make a decision as to what you're going to choose to serve that day. You can keep serving the world, and the world will give you what it has for you. So Solomon says, if. Why? Because receiving the words of wisdom and hiding the commandments in your heart happens because you choose to allow it to do that. And once you hear it, you can hear it, but that doesn't mean you're going to receive it. God's intention is to receive. I know because of my counselor, of people. I can give you counsel, but if you don't receive it, then then all I am is giving you information. The proof is in the pudding. Did it change you? Did it shape you? Is it molding you? Most people, it just doesn't because we're so caught up in the world. Once you hear it, you have to receive it. What must be received? Look at what he says in the verse. He says, my words. He wants you to receive words. You are not to just receive the message of God, the doctrines of God, even the fundamentals of God, but receiving the word and words of God means that you hear them, you apply them, you accept them as truth, even though you might not understand them (coughs) or agree with them. Turn to John chapter 17, verse 8. And look at what he says in John 17, verse 8. He says, for I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me. John 17, 8. And then he says this, and they have received them. And have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. He said they received them, they believed them. I gave them. Paul explains it this way to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Let's go there. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Look at what he said in verse 13. And all of these verses are in the outline that I gave you so you can be one step ahead of me, okay? Because this is what happened to the Thessalonians. He says, for this cause also thank we God without ceasing because when you receive the word of God, which he heard of us, He says, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. I can preach the word every day. I can preach sermons every day, and I try to labor in the word at least to give you something. But if you're not going to receive it, then it you then then this is part of an organization that on two days a week, if you show up here, then you show up at. And you do your Sunday thing or your Wednesday thing, and then you step back out of it and you go back into the world. You did you heard it, you didn't receive it. Here's point two. Not only must they be received, but the words then must be hidden. Because he says in in, in the second part of of chapter 2, verse 1, he says in the first part, he says, My son, that thou wilt receive my words. And then he says, And hide my commandments with you, with thee. Proverbs chapter 2. He said, I just don't want you to receive it. But what you received, you need to then hide it in your heart. See, because other words is just a word. 
We have available to us the very word and words of God. In our hand, God wrote a book directly to us and gave us his words. But having them is not enough. We have to receive them. And then when, when we have received it, we have to hide it in our hearts. You and I have free will to do as we please, but the objective for every believer, hear me, guys, should be victory. How can I live a victorious life? How can I go through a 24-hour period and live in victory? In my home, in my marriage, with my kids, in my job, in my neighborhood, with my friends, with my family? How can I live victoriously so that by the end of the day, I can't look back at all of this craziness that went on in my life. And it was just chaos, just nuts. That's not victory. That's trying to live through a defeated life where you never really experience victory. That was supposed to go on out there. It wasn't supposed to go on with people in the body of Christ. God, so we, to the extent that God said, I don't expect for you to do it. I need to come and live in you through the person of the spirit of God, and the victory will be through him. But we don't take advantage of him because we don't even know who he really even is. So we never have victory. Says in Psalm 119, verse 11, he says, thy word... Have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee? If you're not taking what you're receiving and hiding it in your heart, see, because you need to have something to pull up in the moment. You need to have something that was hidden in your heart that when, when the circumstances of life impacted you, you had something down deep. That became the thing that, that led you through it. Otherwise, you, re, you, you become reactive. You're reacting to everything. And what he's saying here is this. You got to be proactive. You got to hide this thing in your heart. You don't hide it in your heart when you're in the middle of the chaos. You pull it out so that it, it brings you through the chaos. Otherwise, you're going you're you're to go live day after day after day after day after day after day after day, and you're going to be defeated every day. The objective of hiding the word of God in your heart is that I might not sin against thee. Living a life that is not dominated by sin has to be not only our objective, but it has to be a choice. That I am going to rise above, I can't do this every day. You ever, you ever been sick and tired of being sick and tired? Just tired. Sitting in your driveway thinking, <sighs> wake up in the morning and think, I got to go to work. I got to go to work. I don't want to go. I don't want to deal with this. God never. God said, I don't expect for you through your own willpower to just do better. He said, I'm going to come and live in you. And I'm going to give you my word. And in my word is going to be wisdom. And that wisdom, if you apply it, if you receive it, will give you victory on a daily basis. And before you know it, you'll have years of victory. Otherwise, you're consumed. The world is just eating you up and you're just reacting to it. Here's point three. Wisdom also then must be responded to. Look at what he says back in Proverbs chapter two. Because we're moving on down the line here in, this, in Proverbs. Right? So you want to keep your finger there because we're going to be going back there. It's my bullet points. 
He says, so that thou incline thy ear, you got to hear it, to wisdom, and then apply thine heart to understanding the wisdom. Yea, if thy then criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding. Four responses that we're supposed to have. With God's wisdom being made available to us through his written word, until that wisdom pierces our hearts, you know what it is? It's just wisdom. There are seven gates to the heart, or what we call this, your soul. The very word of God must be hidden in the heart to be able to receive knowledge and understanding. To understand wisdom, we need to make an active and determined effort to become acquainted with wisdom by daily study. And that happens when we then incline your ear to hear it. And you hear even things by reading it. Because it doesn't matter if you read, I don't care if you read the Bible, I don't care if you go to sleep reading it. If you don't hear it, it's wasting your time. You cannot learn wisdom by osmosis. You must be available to hear wisdom even being taught. You got to be faithful. Help me. Available. Spirit led and what? Most people, they're not teachable. And you know how you know they're not teachable? Because they don't change. They walk through the door, disaster, and here, year, years later, they're still a disaster because they weren't teachable. They heard it, but it didn't pierce their heart. There are three ingredients that every child of God has to have to make, to make this happen. He has to have knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. Biblically, through the word of God, we have been given the knowledge of God. Knowledge is facts. But facts are not enough. They have to be received and then applied to your life so that facts become wisdom. Wisdom are the facts that have been given by God according to his word applied to your life. Many men have access to the word of God and from it, they get knowledge. But until they receive it and apply it, it's just information. So when you have taken the facts written in the word of God and apply them to your life and the situations that are happening in your life, then you will acquire understanding. Solomon said it this. He said this in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 7. Just listen, I'll read it to you. He said, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get what? He said, get an understanding. Most people have, we have wisdom. And if you read it, you're reading wisdom. But wisdom doesn't help you if you don't understand it. If it and, and the proof is in the pudding. Is it changing you? The highest wisdom in this world found in the word of God is found in the word of God, but until you're willing to incline your ear to the hearing of his word, it will never make it in. I was telling someone today, because we are now in a, in a generation where people think, and I heard someone told me this last night uh, in discipleship. They said, well, I, 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 I um, they said, well, I listen because they don't come to church and I'm ready to make a different decision with them because, you know, they, they're like, well, well, you know, I, I listen it from my, you know, my house. And I thought to myself, I said, you know, it's like taking your, it's like saying, telling your kids, well, we're going to go to Worlds of Fun. 
But then you get your computer out and you get a roller coaster on TV, you know, on the screen. And you sit him in the chair and say, okay, here we go. And then you get behind him and lean him forward and lean him to the side and do, right? It ain't the same. It's not, it ain't even close. It's the same as saying that you went to Worlds of Fun because you watched the roller coaster on, TV, on the screen. It ain't the same. And I'm making it intentionally not the same. Receiving the word of God as truth will make you run to it to solve the issues of life. Not run to a psychologist or a psychiatrist. They can only give you the wisdom of man. The Bible has the wisdom of God. Solomon said, that, w- that we should cry after knowledge and lift up our voices for understanding. And the reason is because neither is easily found. Wisdom only becomes understanding when, when it has been applied to your heart. Then when wisdom is applied doing through this is how God will then determine if it became wisdom is that he allows circumstances that then happen to see if you apply wisdom to the circumstance. Otherwise, it was just information. If in the midst of it, you still cuss at somebody and go off and go freaking nuts, you didn't apply wisdom. Oh, you heard it. You read it. But did it work for you? When wisdom is applied to the circumstances and issues of life, it then becomes understanding. Because now you understand. I get it. You ever been sitting there and you go, I get it. You say, you know, know, people come to me and they say, I've been telling my kid that forever. Why are they listening to you? Because from you, it was knowledge. It was information. But it never became understanding. So that because understanding applied to the circumstance will change you. And all of us are growing to get there. So I'm saying this because there's a growth. But how long, how long are you going to grow? You ever seen a, a, a 50-year-old kid? Here's point four. Wisdom then must become resolute. He says this in Proverbs 2.4. We're just going on down. We're we're matriculating on down the line. He says, if thou seekest her wisdom as silver and searchest for her as for hidden treasures. You know when I believe that you start seeking wisdom and applying wisdom? Sometimes when you when you get tired of being of hurting. And you go, I got it. something's got to give. We live in a, in, a, in a divorce society, so when things that go wrong, we just divorce it. If I don't want my car, I can just commit, quit making the payments. If I don't want my house, I just let them foreclose on it. If I don't want my job, I just quit it. If I don't want my wife, I just divorce it. If I don't want my husband, I just get a new one. If I don't want my car, I just let them repo it. I'm going to divorce myself from this thing instead of applying wisdom that will help me to navigate through it so that I'm not losing things. Our search for wisdom must be just as resolute as man's earthly search for silver and gold. That's what he's saying. He says, if thou seekest for her as seek for wisdom, as seekest for her as silk, and searcheth for her as hid treasures. Mining for silver and gold required determined resolve. Wisdom is a hidden treasure that we have to resolve in our hearts that I'm going to find her. Unlike the men who spend their lives searching for earthly treasures hidden in the sea, within the context of the word and words of God, you know what God is hidden in there? Wisdom. 
All God asks for of us is that we seek after her, search for her in the same way that men search for hidden treasures of this world that are temporal. Jesus gave us a clue. He said, turn to Luke chapter 11. Keep your hand in Proverbs 2 because we're coming right back there. He says this in Luke chapter 11, verse 9. He says, and I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. You know what the scripture of James says? James says you have not because you ask not. You know what? Do you want wisdom? Do you want wisdom applied to your situation? Do you want knowledge and understanding? It's found in the book. Ask God for it. He'll give it to you. It ain't going to happen overnight. He'll change your circumstances. He changed mine. I'm only pastor in this church because God, I, 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 I am a, a living, walking, breathing person that if God didn't change me, I wouldn't be married now. The silver and gold that men search for in this life avails them nothing. But the wisdom of God, tucked away, hidden in the word of God, is to be searched for, listen to me, every day, asking God, Praying to him in the morning, say, I'm getting ready to get in your word. God, reveal the truth here. Help me, Lord, because I need it. I'm desperate for it. Things done out of desperation sometimes are good. You ever been backed into a corner? Financially? Emotionally? You've been backed into, you, I'm telling you, it's either fight or flight. Sometimes I don't know if we were experiencing enough that, that I pray that God helps you to experience some stuff to change you. Because he wants to. Silver and gold is tucked away in the word of God. And it's to be searched for with everything in our hearts because there are consequences for acquiring it and not acquiring it. If you receive the word, then hide what you've received. Incline your ear to wisdom. Apply it to your heart. If you cry after knowledge, if you lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek after wisdom as silver and search for her as you would search for a hidden treasure, then God has a plan for you. If you do that and you get volition, you get free will, you don't have to do it. You can, if you're satisfied with where you are, keep doing what you do. As long as you remember this, if you always do what you always did, you'll always get what you always got. Sometimes you need to change up. Here's point B. Because there are consequences of acquiring wisdom. Let's look at them. And then we'll be done. Here it is, point one. It's the fear of the Lord. Dealing with the knowledge of God. That's what goes in the blank. Fear and knowledge. He says this in verse 5 of Proverbs chapter 2. He said, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find, finally, the knowledge of God. That has to be our pursuit. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, not the end. That's what the scripture says. The fear of the Lord leads us to place our trace, our trust in the Lord, and our trust in the Lord leads us to the fear of the Lord. In the context, fear means fear. Every man ought to know what it means to fear the Lord, not just this reverence of God. Because it's okay to reverence God, but you know what? The fear of the Lord... 
or to keep you from living a life of sin. I talk about my mother enough. Her name was Alberta. Some of y'all have heard her name. Let me tell you, she knew how to put the fear of God in me. And you know what? Sometimes your kids, you know what they need? The fear of God. And, and, and I'm not talking about killing your kids. Right? I'm not talking about beating your kids. Right? <laughs> Scripture says, foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction will drive it far from them. The rod ain't always a stick. But if you don't put the fear of God in your kids, listen, they ain't going to fear you. They'll curse you because they don't fear you because you never put the fear of God in them. Often because you didn't fear God. You thought it was, oh, reverent fear. I love you, Lord. Uh uh. God will whoop your butt. It's called the chastisement of God. Scripture says if you be without chastisement, we're all our partakers, then you're bastards and not children. What's that? God said, if you don't get me, if you screwing up and I don't whoop you, then you weren't my child. Because he, he says that every good father get chastises his kids. Keep them from running out in the street. You know why they won't run out in the street? Because they fear you. It'll keep, because, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, because your kid is going to come to the evil day. You hear me? You got little kids. You know, some of you guys got young kids. You don't even have kids. Your kids are still in the seed. But every kid faces the evil day. Every kid does. Every kid faces the evil day. It's a day when they sneak into your medicine cabinet or some kid, or some girl, some guy tells your daughter, if you would, if you love me, you would. Honey, I love you. And she's looking for love from her daddy. And she's finding that some guy's pants hang around his ankles. And she thinks it's love. Because you never had to give him, he taught him the fear of God because you didn't sometimes. That's not a given, but often that's true. If it, if it hurts, wear it. The fear of the Lord is the beginning. Man ought to know what it means to fear the Lord because it will keep you from living a life of sin. It's why we hide the word of God in our heart so that we might not sin against thee. He says that we will find the knowledge of God, not, not just knowledge about God. Knowledge about God will only puff you up. Facts or knowledge, but the knowledge of God is learning what God's opinion is and then applying that opinion to your life. They then bring about the wisdom of God, and that wisdom will give us an understanding of who God is, and knowing who God is will cause you to have the fear of the Lord. Our challenge today is that men don't fear God. We don't fear him. I can, I can preach the consequences that God will bring on you, but until you fear him, you just think that it won't get you. You think I'm talking about somebody else. Here's, what, here's, my, here's my point here in, the, in your outline, the next point. Until you understand the fear of the Lord, you will not find the knowledge of God. Because the knowledge of God is gained through getting the facts of God found in the word of God. That's what goes in the blank. God knows what he's doing, guys. Let him do what he's doing. You're going through stuff. You're dealing with stuff. Some, the the only, hear hear me, because I dealt with this at the jail today. It was a big deal, too. We have to be careful 
to allow pride to, to hinder us from allowing God to do his perfect work in us. And often it's because you're not faithful, available, spirit-led, or teachable. So we have pride. Scripture says there are three things that destroy a man. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. And I, whenever I'm dealing, even a counseling situation, I'm looking to see is this lust of the eyes, is this lust of the flesh, or in most cases, 90% of them are pride. Pride is dirty. It's filthy. It's nasty. It's gotten so many men killed. It's destroyed so many marriage pride. It'll, it'll make you think that you can figure stuff out when you can. Only pride. You know what's the opposite of pride, right? Humility. And most people won't humble themselves and say, I'm jacked up, man. Or they say, I'm jacked up, but then they don't, they don't apply the wisdom to change. They hear it. The knowledge of God is plainly connected to the self-revelation of God through his book. Because God is trying to reveal himself. Here's point two. Let's look at the origin of wisdom. Where did it come from? Look at what he says in verse six. He says, for the Lord giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. Three things that God gives to the believer, wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And it did not come from the mouth of Buddha or Muhammad. It did not come from Confucius. It did not come from the Dalai Lama. Wisdom, knowledge, and understanding did not come from the mouth of politicians, educators, philosophers, or scientists. Wisdom and knowledge did not come from the mouth of familiar spirits, the utterances of mediums, so-called prophets. Wisdom, knowledge, and understanding did not come from psychologists who put out a shingle to deal with your issues of life while they drain your pocketbooks. Wisdom, knowledge, and understanding comes from the Lord. Wisdom comes from the mouth of God that's the, from which we have as the words of God. That brings us to Point number three, the object of wisdom. We have the origin of wisdom, the object of wisdom. We're in verse seven, Proverbs 2, 7. He says, he layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. Watch this. God is laying up wisdom specifically for the righteous. And the only righteous one is Christ. So if you don't have Christ living in you, he ain't laying up wisdom for you. You know, we look for man's wisdom. We get good. You know, most of us want to thrive in our jobs. So we have to learn, get, and I'm speaking to a couple of my salesmen that I know that's in here today. Hallelujah. Right? If you're going to be a good salesman, you got to have the wisdom of how to sell. I don't care if you're a nice person all day. If you don't know how to sell, ain't nobody going to buy nothing from you. How does a Kirby vacuum cleaner ring people's doorbell and sells them a $2,000 vacuum cleaner? I can go to Walmart and get a vacuum cleaner for 40 bucks. But he knows how to sell. He's gained wisdom from it. God is saying, I have wisdom. You need to learn wisdom if you're ever going to sell me. I've given you all the wisdom that you know. You know what your problem is? You're not available. Got too much world going on, man. I got world going on, brother. You just don't understand. I'm trying to build my kingdom. I'm not going to submit to the kingdom. 
God is laying up righteous wisdom for righteous, for the righteous, and for them that walk uprightly, he says. The application of wisdom makes you righteous, and ch- it, you know what it'll do? It'll change your walk. God is preparing a spiritual bank account for the believer that you will be able to draw from for all of eternity. You know what's the challenge? How do I get to heaven and I'm bankrupt because the only thing I invested in was in this world and I left it behind for my kids? There are five things that sound wisdom will produce. He says, he layeth up sound wisdom, Proverbs 2, 7. Let's look at those five things. Keisha, did you put these in? Here it is. In Titus, you want to write that these should be in your notes. Go look. I didn't put the verses in. Titus 1, 9, he says, he gives you sound doctrine. In 2 Timothy 1, 7, he gives you a sound mind. In Titus 1, 13, he gives you sound faith. In 2 Timothy 1.13, he gives you sound words. And in Titus 2.8, he gives you, he'll then give you sound speech. You men that preach at the mission or have other preaching opportunities, that's a sermon for you. Or the ladies, anyone. If you're doing a devotion, do a devotion on, on the sound using Proverbs chapter 2, verse 7 as your proof text. When you have placed your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, then wisdom becomes a buckler. In the Old Testament, a buckler was a shield that was used to push back an enemy, or it was a harness which was studded with metal and was used as a shield to protect the figure who wore it. You and I are in a spiritual war, amen? And there is a spiritual enemy, amen, that must be fight on spiritual grounds. We cannot fight against this enemy in a conventional way. We, I learned that from reading what the, 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 arch, the Mike, Michael the archangel said in the book of Jude, when, or when it, when it was written in Jude, it says, yet Michael... Jude 1 9. It says, Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. He durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuked thee. He said, I'm not even fighting you. Our only hope in being victorious in this war that we're waging is to walk uprightly so that we can have sound wisdom from the Lord who is our buckler. He is our shield. He is our protector. It's the only hope we have. Here's point four. I'm trying to get you on home. The outcome of wisdom. This is how it ended up working. He keeps our path. He says in Proverbs chapter 2, verse 8, The first part, he says, he keepeth the paths of judgment. In God's providence, he is a just God. He is a righteous God. But we live in an unjust world, an unrighteous world that is against God and the people of God. When we seek after the wisdom of God as 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 it were a hidden treasure, God then, as a result, preserves us from unjust judgment. He is our protector from unrighteous paths of judgment from evil men. It's a hard lesson for most people because we believe that justice we have, we believe that we need to protect it. No justice, no peace. So we're willing to defend justice. I heard that uh, I was before dawn and I left. They would uh, in the city, and I don't know if any of you guys live in the city or even know that on whether it's the trams or the buses, you can ride them for free, right? In the but the, the ATA system in Kansas City or those trains, right? That they got, you can ride. They're free. You don't have to pay anything. The problem is, is that 
they're, they're wanting to add a fair only for this reason because there are, they said that there are homeless people who are mentally ill who use the bus as their homes almost because they're free. So they get on them and they ride all day. The challenge is, is that they're asking the train driver or the bus driver to police the homeless people who are riding, who are mentally ill, who are going after other customers, who are cussing out other people, who are getting into fights, who are doing all these things. And then this one guy said, you know, so, and I'm like this with it, you know, I wouldn't want that job, right? But there's one guy who's like, there has to be justice for these people. And it's a slippery slope. You know, because you want to help people. You want to have compassion for people. But it's a slippery slope. If you, you, now we're asking, but did put police on there then. Instead of asking the bus driver, is that what he's hired for too? But we live, here's my main point. We live in a day where people fight for justice instead of realizing that the day that's going to come that they're going to have to stand before the Lord, the just God. And they're going to have to give an account for how they live their life here on planet Earth. And he's a just God. He is. You know what he's going to give you? You know what he says? You reap what you've sown. I gave you my word. I gave you my spirit. I gave you the church of God. I gave you every tool that you needed on planet Earth to live this out to, 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 to my glory. And what you did was that you took your three score and ten and you lived it to your glory. You lived it the way you wanted to live. You did the things that satisfied you. You gave me no glory. You looked for, you looked for, you looked for, for things in other human beings. And when they didn't give it to you, you divorced them. Like you divorced me. And he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. Because you didn't know me. And I gave you everything to know who I was. And you didn't know me. You knew of me. You knew about me. You even professed to know me. But you didn't know me. Here's my main point. God is the one who preserves us from unjust judgment at the hands of those who would unjustly do us wrong. We have to place our faith in that or we will try to direct our own destiny especially when we think that we've been done in an unjust manner. Let me tell you something. Sometimes God told, told uh, in the Old Testament, he told Joshua, he said, when you get there, he said, you don't have to fight the battle. He said, the battle is the Lord's. And you know what we're doing in life? We're fighting. We're fighting because we think that we have to get justice. Instead of giving it over to the Lord. We have to be careful. I'm preaching this for a reason. Here's the second thing he does. He preserves our way. He said, and preserve it the way of the saints. By his power and by his grace, God has preserved our way by leading us in his way. And Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We are the righteous one. Called of the Lord, preserved for the day that we stand before him in glory. He has preserved for us everlasting life to rule and reign with him in the kingdom. And we are kept by his mercy and his grace until the day the psalmist talks about. You need to read Psalms 23 to do that, to get a better understanding of it. The word of God will preserve your family the word of God will preserve your marriage, your children, your mouth, your tongue, your walk. Solomon in this second chapter gives us a pattern for how to live 
our lives and what it is to do. He says, when you receive the words of God and hide the commandments found in the scriptures in your heart, in verse 1, when you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding, verse 2, when you cry after knowledge and lift up your voice for understanding, verse 3, when you seek after wisdom, seeking her as you would silver and hidden treasures, verse 4, there are six things that God will do that are for those who are truly seeking after wisdom. Here it is. One, he gives you wisdom, verse 6. Two, he speaks to you, verse 6. Three, he will store up wisdom to you, verse 7. He will protect you, verse 7. He protects you specifically from unjust judgment, verse 8. He will preserve you, verse 8. God knows what he's doing. He's got a plan. So we're at the end. The end result of seeking wisdom. Here it is in verse 9. This is what he says. Then shalt thou understand righteousness, then shalt thou understand judgment, then shalt thou understand equity, yea, every good path. When you seek after wisdom, what will God do for you? He will make you to understand righteousness and judgment and equity and every good path. You know, when we think about our relationship with the Lord, Here it is. We're on a path. We're on a journey, actually. You're on a journey that puts you on a pathway. God intends for you to be on the right path. I tell tell this to our young people all the time because I think it's important to tell them. When we're born physically here on earth, hear me, I'm speaking to our parents here specifically. Your kids are going to be on a path. If you train them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, your kids will be on the right path. They won't end up with somebody that they're going to meet when they cross paths. Because at the same time that you are training your child up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, You know what ends up happening? Somebody is training their child up who's a little bit, maybe a little bit younger, maybe a little bit older than your child. And they're not coming up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. They're coming up in the world. And and this is what's going to happen. If your kid is on the right path, they're going to run into the right person. But if they're on the wrong path, they're going to cross paths with somebody And before you know it, you're going to be a mess. Because we love our kids. And your kid is out here. And if you don't bring them up in the right way, they're going to meet some kid whose mother was turning tricks. You know, who was, I I know I, I listened in the jail. I listened. These kids were smoking meth with their parents, man, when they were in eighth grade. The parents were dealing drugs. Was your dad incarcerated? Was your mom? I don't even know. And here's your kid in a correctional facility because they want us to correct them. They want us to correct all the mistakes that parent made all their life. And the only way they know how the world knows how to do it, instead of, instead, instead of giving them instruction, They incarcerate them, put them behind bars. It's the only way they know how to correct people. They don't have a hand. Just stick them away so we don't have to deal with them, so Christians don't have to minister to them because we're busy in our churches learning all kinds of other crap. So we don't have to actually go and minister to somebody who's lost and dying and going to hell. Just stick them in 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 a cell. Just incarcerate them. That way you don't have to deal with them. Put them in a little commune. Just isolate them from from you so you don't actually have to to evangelize anyone. Because we're not evangelizing people. We're not reaching people. We're not, I mean, it's tragic, man. 
Christ says, I went, we're neither hot nor cold. He said, I just want to spew it out of my mouth, man. He said, I'm just sick from it. He said, I'm standing at the door knocking. And if any man will just let me in. He said, because you notice what in Revelation chapter 3, Laodicea, he says, if any man. You know why? Because there ain't no corporate revivals going on. You ain't seeing mass people come to Christ anymore. It ain't happening. So you know what he's looking for? He said, give me one person who's willing to do what's right. And I'll work with them. He said, I'll come in and I'll sup with you. And I'll be your God. And you shall be my people. And he's in other words, he's standing at the door knocking. Can I come in? Purpose in your heart to be the person that you let them in. You let them change you. You let them shape you and mold you. Let them change your marriage. Let them change your relationship. Learn the wisdom of what it means to be a parent. Learn the wisdom of what it means to be a wife. Learn the wisdom of what it means to be a husband. Learn the wisdom of what it means, men, to be Christ's bride so that you know what kind of bride to be looking for. Learn that wisdom. And don't let it just be knowledge. Let it become understanding so that you live it out and you live the principles of it. Otherwise, you're just coming to church. It's an exercise. And that's not what I'm here for. Dawn knows I'm plugged in my office, man, saying, God, you got to give me something to give people. And I take introduction, and then he says, okay, here you go, Ray. I'll give it to you. He says, if you seek me, I'll be found. I'll, yeah, I'll, be, I'll be found. But you got to seek me with the whole heart. Don't seek me half-heartedly. Can you imagine paying a million dollars for a meal and they only give you half the meal? 